Gospel of John, chapter 2. Gospel of John, chapter 2. We're starting to look at some of the aspects of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ when he walked on earth. Uh, last week we saw that uh, he now has five disciples with him. And uh, his ministry is actually going to commence and he's going to do his first miracle, his first sign at the wedding of Cana. Now if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you recognize that there is a purpose statement at the end of the book. John 20, verse 30 and 31 says, Truly Jesus did many other signs, and this is a key word here in the Gospel of John, signs, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these ones that are, and there's eight, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. John's Gospel is unique in many ways relative to the other ones. He covers things that the other gospel writers do not. And the reason he does this is because he has a different objective. He has a different emphasis. He emphasizes seven miracles and eight when you consider the death and resurrection and the three and a half years of ministry that Christ did on earth. And so he's doing this so that those who would read the gospel of John would come to this very conclusion right here, that he's the savior of the world and through faith in him, Eternal life is freely received and can never be lost. If you read the other gospel accounts, you'll find that Jesus did all kinds of miracles, but in only this one, um, during his time on earth, there's only seven and then his resurrection. Interesting. Now I wondered as I've thought about this even this week, why did John just pick these seven on earth? and then the resurrection. It's interesting. Because John here says himself that if you wrote them all down, there wouldn't be books to contain it. And so what are these signs? We're gonna see one today, transforming water into wine. He'll be healing the sun at Cana. He'll be healing the paralytic at Bethsaida. Multiplying fish and loaves, that one is in all the gospel accounts. Walking upon the Sea of Galilee, healing the blind man in Jerusalem, raising Lazarus from the dead and Christ's death and resurrection. And so as one would look at these signs, the Spirit of God would say these things are designed to show you that Christ is in fact worthy of your trust. But it's helpful to understand the purpose of signs in the Bible. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, well, God, give me a sign. You know, what are the purpose of these signs? Well, here's a sign. It's lame. It's a lame joke. Well, you did ask for a sign, and there's a billboard on the highway. God, it's probably not exactly what people were looking for, but someone has a sense of humor. That's good. Uh, God certainly gave a lot of signs in the Old Testament. In fact, in ancient Israel, uh, high priest wore a vest. It had two stones in it called Urim and Thummim. And whenever a question about God's will was brought to the priest, he would ask God, and, and one of these stones would glow either indicating divine approval or divine disapproval. Um, and what you're reading, I think, wouldn't that be nice? You know? Why, Lord, what, should I go this way? Stone lights up. Go this way. I mean, that would be nice, but it doesn't work that way. And obviously, most of us are familiar with the story of Gideon, who was basically an unremarkable man um, that God wanted to use to free his people from the oppression of these foreign oppressors, and, and he doubted uh, his qualifications, and, uh, and so he asked God for a sign, and he put out a fleece, and, you know, if, if God, this is truly of you, have dew on the fleece and not on the ground, and then the next day he asked again, and vice versa, and so forth, and, and uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, have adopted that approach to doing the will of God. They put out what they consider fleeces, and uh, again, it'd be nice to get all these divine answers to our issues in that fashion, but that's not how it is. Um, you know, the Old Testament, uh, God did things a little differently. In fact, what you perceive today as a sign from God can be very, very tricky. Um, you need to, I mean, how many people have been disappointed that when they thought they had a clear sign from God and they 
followed it and it didn't work at all, out at all like they, they thought it would. But when it comes to signs, there's a sign, right? Jesus Christ loves you, that's a good sign. If you happen to see a sign, that would be a true sign. In fact, there's all kinds of signs in the Word of God if you want to look at it that way. Here's a warning sign. You cannot fool God, so don't make a fool of yourself. You will harvest what you plan. If you follow your own selfish desires, you will harvest destruction. But if you follow the Spirit, you will harvest eternal life. And so there's signs there if you're willing to look, and it's on the pages of the book that you hold this morning. But in the Old Testament, signs often involved a miracle, God performing a supernatural event uh, through a human servant. And, uh, you know, if you look at the book of Exodus, there was all kinds of them there. But it would be a mistake to conclude that all the signs that God gave in the Old Testament were miraculous because they weren't. In fact, as time went on, uh, less and less, quote, miraculous signs uh, appeared. Oftentimes, God would use very mundane things as a sign. If you'll read Ezekiel, God said this. He said, you also, son of man, take a clay tablet, lay it before you, portray on it a city, Jerusalem, lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mound against it, set camps against it also, and place battering ramps against it all around. Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. So this was, there was nothing supernatural about this at all. Um, but signs obviously can be miraculous. There's a gradual shift. Uh, from the miraculous to the mundane uh, as time goes on. But this is what you need to recognize, that all Old Testament signs serve to authenticate God's appointed divine messengers so that people would believe the message they brought. And this is also going to be true in the New Testament when it comes to the signs performed by our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the signs of Exodus, for example, confirm the authenticity of Moses as God's messenger, and therefore it often, it often I can't say the word, authenticated the message that he spoke. And so, in fact, if, as we think of the miracles that Moses did before Pharaoh, the repeated purpose of these signs was that there would be no doubt in the mind of all those that were affected by it that this is God's, that God is God. In fact, it's interesting, if you, if you look at these, I just find this fascinating. When Moses first came to Pharaoh and said, let my people go out and worship, it says, after Moses and Aaron went and told Pharaoh, and says, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that I may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, and this is interesting, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I do not know the Lord, and so I'm not going to let Israel go. Oh, really? And so this is what God decided to do with his signs. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out of, under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you should know the very thing that Pharaoh said he didn't know, that I am the Lord your God who brings you out of the burdens of the Egyptians. Repeatedly it says God did these signs so that those affected by them would know that he's the Lord. Next chapter, but Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that what? I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So he says, you know what, I'm going to do this for the sake of the Egyptians. There's going to be no doubt in their mind that I am the Lord, God said. Next chapter, and in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that what? You may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. In fact, he did this for his own children, not only the Egyptians, but the nation of Israel itself. He says, I'm going to give you a sign that you may know. Exodus 10, now the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell, notice, there's even a greater purpose, tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know 
that I am the Lord. And so there was a clear objective through these signs that the people would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's the Lord. And so as you think of the Gospel of John, while there are signs recorded in various places in the New Testament, they take a prominent role in this Gospel. It's uniquely different from the Synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the uniqueness, actually, of the Gospel of John can be seen in what it leaves out in comparison to the subject matter that you would find in the other Gospels. John's Gospel lacks a nativity story. It lacks the temptation of Christ. It lacks the narrative parables. It lacks extensive teaching on the kingdom of God. It doesn't have the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't have the Olivet Discourse and so forth. And yet the Gospel of John contains things not found in the other ones. For example, we have the I Am sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. We have the Upper Room Discourse in John 13 through 17. And we have these signs of Jesus. So John's unique emphasis of these signs makes us wonder, what is the purpose here? What is he trying to show us? What should we learn from them? And some things we can observe about the signs in this gospel, as I'm giving you an overview of this gospel here, all the signs recorded in John's gospel were performed in public in the presence of witnesses. These things were not done in a closet. They weren't done in secret. They were meant for the public to see. In fact, what's interesting about these miracles that we see in the gospel of John is they're specifically called signs. That is the word that John employs referring to each of the signs that occur here. He wants his readers to understand the mighty acts of our Savior, specifically his signs, interpreting them in light of what the Old Testament teaches about the nature and purpose of signs. These signs in John's Gospel also share a common cumulative and collective purpose. There's a specific purpose with these signs. We've already seen that in John 20, 31. These signs are written down so that you may believe. And so there's a collective purpose in all of these things, that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Very important. Now, the signs mentioned in John God's Gospel have much in common with the signs of the Old Testament. But there's one important difference. The signs that Jesus performed testify of the divine authenticity of his message, as well as the greater reality that Jesus himself is the divine message. That wasn't true of Moses. And so these eight signs here in John's Gospel not only verify Jesus' assertion that he proclaims the word of God, but he is in fact the word of God manifested in the flesh. And so when Jesus performed these signs, he declared something about himself that Moses could never claim. What is it? With these signs, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Very unique to John's Gospel. God manifested in the flesh. And this is something that comes out as you read the Gospel. This is something Christ repeatedly referred to. In John 5, for example, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. This is a claim of deity. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Again, he's saying, what he's communicating through that terminology is that I'm God. I'm God manifest in the flesh. In John 10, he says, If you... If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. If I'm not God, don't believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I'm in him. And so Jesus said, these signs that I do, these works indicate equality with the Father. He openly declared that he was the Son of God and these signs were designed to corroborate that reality. And so these signs would prove that Jesus is the Christ, the very Son of God. He was making a case for who he is. And so John, that's John's objective in writing his his gospel account. In fact, some scholars have noted that John's gospel is like a legal brief arguing why we should believe in Jesus Christ. At the center of that argument are these signs that Jesus did. And so John is using these eight signs as building blocks of evidence 
Each sign adds to the weight of evidence. In fact, they go up. The last sign he does before the crucifixion and resurrection is the raising of Lazarus. I mean, if that ain't going to get it done, what's going to get it done? Right? I mean, that's kind of John's closing argument. Jesus didn't perform any more signs on earth anymore. After his death and resurrection, he specifically ministered to his disciples. And gave them the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So John is saying, like, if you don't have faith after coming to grips with all this, and after even seeing that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, you will never believe. The issue is not, isn't there any evidence? The issue is always a condition of the heart. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if you don't see it through these things, nothing more can be done. You know, the Spirit of God is in the world today, taking these very things and trying to draw mankind to himself. John himself said, or Christ himself said in John 68 through 11, that the Holy Spirit has come. He'll convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Of sin because they don't believe in me, of judgment because the rule of this world is judged and are righteous because I go to my Father and you see me no more. These things all indicate that Christ is the Messiah and the Spirit of God is trying to reach people. He's got a convicting ministry to the lost and he uses these things as well as the preaching of the gospel so that you, me, and everyone else would run to Jesus Christ for salvation. But a lot of people fail to read the signs. Many people saw Jesus do many, many miracles. And yet, what does John 12, 37 say? Though he had done so many signs before them, they still didn't believe in him. Isn't that amazing? The failure to grasp the meaning of the signs was not limited to the Jews of Jesus' day either. It's a problem going on today. And the issue again is not the signs, the issue is the condition of the heart. I mean, look at this. Mankind has impressed himself that after years of research, they can come up with a mechanical hand that works pretty good. And yet they say that your hand, which is infinitely more complex and infinitely more talented, somehow that just happened. I mean, that is pure blindness. They, they would admit readily that intelligent design is needed for you to create a hand, and you're trying to actually emulate something God already did, and yet you look at a hand and say, somehow that happened. Tom Stiegel mentioned at the uh, men's camp and trip, the, your iris has the ability to discern millions of different things. It's such a complex thing. And, and yet, in fact, if you were evolving, how would you know you needed an eyeball? And how would you design the eyeball? The eyeball just didn't happen. And why is it in your face? Why didn't it coming out your ear or whatever? I mean, it's so crazy. And so the heart, the, the issue is not the evidence. The issue is the heart of man. That's always the problem. I remember years ago when I was working at the paper mill, I got to know a guy and I was witnessing to him on a regular basis. And he was intelligent and he kept blowing me off. And finally, one night, he goes, you know what? I'm outloading my wood stove. Every night, I ask God to send me a sign. Show me his reel. And I said, I'm it. <laughs> and he goes, oh. I said, I'm giving you the truth you're looking for. And he was blown away because he was looking for some other sign, you know? Like I'd pop out of the wood stove, hi, you know, or whatever. <laughs> no. I said, this is the answer. And he, he, was, he just went into shock. And then I, I switched jobs, and I didn't see him for a long time. And he came into my office one day, and he said, I've been reading the scriptures. And I said, I'll be out to see you. And he got saved. And it was pretty amazing. But what was he looking for a sign? I mean, I mean, how much more? I mean, it's crazy. And yet the purpose of John's gospel is to show that, you know what? Jesus is the Christ, and you have no excuse. He made some exclusive statements. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father what through me. I mean, that's an amazing statement. He could say that, though, because of the uniqueness of himself, that he was God. 
He's the only way to the Father. In fact, he is the only one that gives life. It said in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and you might have it more abundantly. In fact, I give eternal life. I'm the one that gives it. And when I give it, since it's eternal, you will never perish. In fact, no one can snatch you out of my hand. End of story. That is who our God is. That's who Christ is. And the reason you could say it is because the very thing that separated mankind from a holy God was sin, and that sin had to be dealt with. We're all born dead to God in trespasses and sins. We had no spiritual life. We're separated from him. And so what every dead person needs is life, and only Christ can give that life. And he gives it freely because he removed the very thing that was causing death in the first place, and that was your sins. He cried out on the cross, it is finished. John 19.30, the only gospel that records those words. And that means paid in full. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. That's why he came, as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And so Jesus' death paid the penalty due upon sin. God's justice system, justice system demands a penalty be paid. If you and I were to pay that penalty, we'd be separated from God forever in the lake of fire with no chance of escape. But Jesus Christ took the death penalty upon himself on that cross, paid it in full, cried out, it is finished. And because of that, salvation is free because he rose from the grave. He won the victory showing that the grave cannot hold him, that he lives forevermore. And the issue is, will you simply receive it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever, it's open to anybody because everyone's sins have been paid for. See, the beauty about salvation is it requires nothing but accepting a payment that someone else made. It's not a matter of turning over a new leaf, making him Lord of your life, repenting from your sins, promising to do better, whatever it is that you might think of. It's free. It's an issue of accepting the payment he made, trusting him and him alone, and you receive at that very moment everlasting life. Amazing. And so the Gospel of John has a specific purpose of using these very signs to point people to that very reality. And there's another thing. These signs have a greater purpose, as we're going to see today, in displaying the glory of Christ. The glory, it's displaying his glory. There's a connection between what we read in the Gospel of John in terms of his signs to what John said in his prologue. He said, in the Word, the Word is Jesus Christ, he was made flesh, he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. How did you behold his glory? Through his signs. This is John's point. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. These signs declare his glory, and John said that we had the privilege of beholding it. Boom, just like that. Amazing. Amazing. And so, even understanding the settings in which each of the seven signs were performed, or the eight signs were performed, helps you. Now, when you think of the miracles of the Bible, I found out there's all kinds of Greek words that were employed by the gospel writers to communicate miracles, and I just thought I'd share those with you. Um, there's six Greek words used to describe miracles or signs. But we'll see, only one is pretty much unique to John. You have the Greek word teres, and, and this is on your handout. This word, the word, in this word, the miracle is regarded as a startling, imposing, or an amazement thing. The word never occurs alone in the New Testament, for our attention is not primarily directed to the result of the miracle, or that which <coughs> the miracle produces. In fact, <coughs> Here's uh, where that particular word is used in John 4:48. Unless you people see signs and wonders. And so the Greek word translated wonders in John is the Greek, that Greek word teres. The word that primarily occurs in John is the Greek word samion. And when applied to a miracle, this word implies that the miracle is an indication of some power or meaning behind it to which the miracle is secondary in importance. And this word is used 17 times in John's Gospel. In the NIV it's translated miraculous sign. We also have the Greek word dynamis. We get our English word dynamite from this. And it emphasizes the power revealed in the performance of the miracle 
and applies the spiritual energy that produced it. In fact, here's a couple of examples. In Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders? And so the word wonders there is dynamo, this powerful things. Didn't we do these in your name? Matthew 11, 20, he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works Powerful works were done because they did not repent. Another Greek word is endoxos. This term emphasizes miracles as being works in which the glory of God and the Son of God shines manifestly forth. Like in Luke 13, 17. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. They just glorified God. It was very obvious there. There's paradoxus. We get our English word paradox from this. This word is used only once in Luke 5, 26, where it's translated strange things God did. He did some strange things relative to the normal course of life. And so it refers to that which is contrary to the order of the natural world and to that which is strange to, uh, to the usual current of thought. And we do that as well. That's how we use it in our English language. And then the last word is thumesosios. This word is used as something that provokes wonder. It occurs only in Matthew 21, 15, where it's rendered wonderful things. People say, look at these wonderful things going on. But the Greek word for signs that John uses is semion. And that's, again, to indicate that the miracles were produced to startle or create excitement. They weren't do that, but that's what they ended up doing. So as you think of the word that we read in John's gospel when it comes to the word signs, this term is used to signify that God was working through the person of his son to reveal his own glory and the glory of the son. And we're going to again see that here in John chapter 2. Another thing to keep in mind when it comes to signs, and this is part of rightly dividing the word of truth, Miracles were especially designed by God to convey a message to the nation of Israel. This is why repeatedly they kept asking for signs. Because throughout their history, God authenticated what he was doing through signs. We saw that when we looked at what Moses did before Pharaoh. In fact, 1 Corinthians 1.22 tells us, Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. When you were dealing with the Greeks, you wanted to use logic and reason or philosophy because that's what appealed to them. But the Jews were always looking for some kind of sign to confirm the truth that was being taught. And so we have the first sign. This is the first miracle done here in John. This is Christ beginning his public ministry. And so here in John chapter 2, Let's read the first three verses. It says, On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And so as you think of the setting of the sign here, the miracle took place on the third day during a wedding feast. And so John was down in Judea, he got some disciples. He went up to Galilee. I think he got Philip and Nathaniel. So he's got five disciples now. So they're hanging out in Galilee. And as you think of these weddings here, this wedding took place in Cana. Now this is approximately eight miles from Nazareth. And where did Jesus grow up? He grew up in Nazareth. And so this is Cana right here. This is Nazareth down here. So you got about eight miles. It's a village about eight miles away. Sea of Galilee is over here. And so this is all Galilee. This whole area here is north of Judea and Samaria. And so we don't know the exact social connection, but Mary and Jesus apparently knew the family. They were invited to the wedding. You know, we think even in our culture, weddings are very big social events uh, in many ways. They can be elaborate, they can be expensive occasions, uh, requiring much planning and so forth. And so, yeah, 
Uh, but in some circles, even the one who hosts a wedding may feel that the eyes of the family and friends are upon him and opportunities for failure are bone. Well, weddings in the first century was that and that, all of that and that much more. Very important social events. They had more social significance back then than they do in our day. A wedding in the first century, especially in a small town like Cana, would be a community event. Usually the entire village was invited. They were lengthy events. They usually lasted between three days and a week. It's a big, big deal. It's a big party. And so we see that Jesus and the disciples are also at the wedding. They're invited guests. And so there's some kind of connection here to this family or this wedding in Cana that involves Mary. And they might have been friends of the family. We don't really know. We can speculate. There's five disciples at this point. You have Andrew, Simon, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, and John. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there. Now, as you think of the circumstances of this sign, they included running out of wine during the wedding celebration. Now, in this culture, that would be like the worst thing that could happen to you as a host. The social significance of the first century wedding depended on the quality of the hospitality that was provided. It was very vital to the family's social standing within, the, within their community. If you failed in this area, you'd be bringing public shame upon yourself. In fact, I read in some commentators, if you put on a wedding and you ran out of wine, you could be sued. I mean, so this is a big deal. You don't be running out of wine at these. And so, obviously, they got a problem here. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, is all over it. And she comes up to Jesus there and says, hey, they run out of wine. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, Mary might have considered this situation providential. Maybe she thinks it's time. She understands her son well. She says, maybe this is a time for you to announce your Messiahship to the world. John the Baptist has already declared him to be Messiah. He's got some disciples following him. A, a well-timed miracle might be a great opportunity for him to declare his identity to the nation. And besides, we could all benefit by you making some wine, right? And so obviously, Mary was going to know Jesus best. She knows him better than anyone else. She has pondered all the miracles she's seen thus far in connection with him, beginning with her cousin Elizabeth getting pregnant, and of course, her being, uh, uh, Jesus being a product of the Holy Spirit and so forth. So she's well aware of these things. Um, and so, she knows what he's capable of. I don't know if she expects him to do that, but maybe she's thinking like every good mother, this is a time for my son to step up to the plate and, and whatever it might be. Well, what can we note about Jesus' response here, verse 4? Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So Mary approached Jesus by simply declaring they have no wine. And Jesus says, First of all, he calls Mary woman. Now, people read this in our vernacular and think that's an unkind, terse response. And, you know, there's, it's, there's a tremendous lack of respect in it, especially talking to your own mother. Um, but actually, that's not what it is at all. In fact, Jesus used the same term when he tenderly spoke to his mother before he died. And so, but he also says, what does your concern have to do with me? Now, this is an interesting phrase. This is a very telling statement. This expression is actually found a number of times in the Old Testament and a few times in the New Testament. And there, the idea is, what do I have to do with you here is really the essence of it. In fact, just to see a situation where it's used in Mark 5, the legion, the group of uh, demons, says he cried out with a loud voice and said, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, the son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So there's the same phrase, actually. What do I have to do with you? 
And so Jesus says to his mother, what do I have to do? What is this? What's going, you know? Why are you telling me about this? And actually what the phrase intended to mean is it actually was a way of distancing. It's an expression of someone distancing themselves from another party. And so it could be translated, what do you and I have in common as far as this matter is concerned? That would be the vernacular. This may have been a minor rebuke to Mary's suggestion that he do something to demonstrate he was the Messiah. And Jesus was indicating to Mary that he also now had a new relationship with his mother. See, when the Spirit of God came down and Jesus Christ uh, was then, his, his father said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased, his whole relationship with his mother changed then. He would, had, she had no authority on him now whatsoever. He was under a new authority, the authority of his heavenly father. And so she's not to presume on him or dictate to him how he is to act. And so he's saying, you know, he doesn't call her mother. He says, woman, our relationship has changed. This is not the same deal. And so as much as mother wants to influence her son, that's not to be the way it is anymore, if you know what I mean. But he's not done there. He says another phrase in verse 4, my hour has not yet come. Now what does that refer to? Well, if you cruise through the Gospel of John, you realize that Jesus' hour refers to the time of his glorification, especially as culminated in the cross. And so the hour here he's spoken of is, is his glorification. In fact, if you go to John 7, Jesus' brothers, this is notice what they say to Jesus here. He says, why don't you depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples may see the works that you are doing? For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. Now, brotherly advice here. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers do not believe in him. Isn't that amazing? This is some sarcasm, I think. Then Jesus said to them, my time is not yet come. But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not go, going up to the feast yet. Why? Because my time or my hour has not yet fully come. It's not time for me to go do what you guys want me to do. In fact, later in the same chapter, the Pharisees sought to take him. But no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Next chapter. These words spoke Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. Now you get into John 12. On the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Which is obviously indicating that when he rises again, that many people are going to get saved. In fact, just a few verses later, he says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. Amazing. And so, when he begins the upper room discourse, in the next chapter, which goes through chapter 17, it says, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come for him to depart out of this world, unto the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end or to the uttermost. And so Mary might have been saying, hey, show them you're the Messiah. For ushering in the kingdom was associated and connected with wine in the kingdom. So she's saying, this is great. You're the Messiah. Do it now. His hour had not yet come. See, in the Old Testament, wine, particularly fine wine, is connected to the work of the Messiah. Notice what the prophet Isaiah said. In Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. 
And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over the, all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people will, he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And so people that were looking for the Messiah recognized that a very fine wine would be an indication that he is, in fact, the Messiah. But Jesus tells his mother, now is not the time. Now is not the time. But I thought the first five is interesting. His mother said to his servants, eh, whatever he says, do. You know, maybe she had some inkling, inkling that he would do something anyway. But, you know, that's never bad advice. Whatever Jesus said, you should do. Right? Uh, does anyone want to amen on that one? And so what does Jesus do? Verse 6. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of perfect purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So Jesus commands that the water pots be filled with water. Jesus said to them, fill the wa water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Now the reason John includes that is because when the miracle takes place, no one could say, well, they were only half full and someone dumped some wine in. No, they were filled to the brim. Now, these water pots would have been between 120 and 180 gallons then. Now, Jewish purification rituals were extensive. The last book of the Mishnah contained 126 chapters with 1,000 separate items of purification. Aren't you think? Don't you? Uh, I mean, I can hardly wash my hands. I, I just, it's amazing, right? And so this is a big deal. I mean, it contained over 30 chapters of instruction. I mean, Judaism became such a, cumbersome thing and that's why Jesus kept making an issue he says you know you work so hard in cleaning up the outside and your heart where it matters is far from me so these were filled to the brim there would be no room for wine to be added now we're not told how Jesus did the miracle he says simply in verse 8 draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it Somehow, some way, that water became wine. Now the question sometimes people ask, was it real wine? Or was it just grape juice? You know what? It's wine. The Greek word for wine here is oinos. It occurs 32 times in the New Testament. And in every case, it's translated wine. Now, there's a fair amount of commentators who want to say that this is heavily diluted wine. It's like grape juice, because they could not believe Jesus was creating anything with alcohol in it. And so they're reading into this thing, though, it just can't be. Now, again, the wine in these days was not like our wine. It was typically three parts water and one part wine, so it was diluted. But the word means wine. In fact, verse 10 actually implies that. Verse 10 says, the head waiter says, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. Why? Because as you drink wine, your taste buds and your sensitivity and your ability to discern good wine from bad slips, and so you start with the good stuff. That's obviously an indication that there's alcohol having an effect, right? But you know, the same word for wine used here is the same word used in Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine. Now, you can't get drunk on, drunk on grape juice. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't think you can. I've never tried. But, you know, and even if it's just diluted wine, that means you just got to drink more of it. That's what it means. But instead, we're to be filled with the Spirit. And so the host would typically, again, serve the best wine first and hold the cheaper wine for later when the guest palates would be deadened and they wouldn't notice the difference. But, you know, drinking wine is not wrong in itself, and yet... The Bible strongly condemns drunkenness. It doesn't command total abstinence, though frankly there's oodles of wisdom in abstaining. 
But the Lord does not condemn those for drinking wine. In fact, Ecclesiastes says a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry. But at the wedding, the wine was diluted. This wine was obviously diluted because drunkenness is condemned in the Bible. But, so Jesus is not endorsing drunkenness here at all. At the same time, this is not grape juice. It's alcoholic wine. Now what I find interesting here, well, let's read here. Verse 9. Now, the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. He didn't know where it came from. Now, the servants who had drawn the water knew, but the master of the feast didn't, so he calls the bridegroom, and he says to him, because the bridegroom was in charge of, of providing these things, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and, and when the guests have well drunk, the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, what's weird about this is there's no mention of how the wedding party or the guests responded to the miracle or even if they knew about it. Again, John doesn't tell us how this whole thing was done. It was very low-key. You know, one thing Jesus didn't do, though, is gather everyone around and say, all right, the man with the goodies is here, watch this, and he, abracadabra, whatever he might say, or, and then taste it now. Ooh. It doesn't say he touched the water pots. It doesn't say he prayed. The focus in the account is not on the spectacular part of the miracle, but on Christ and his glory. You've kept the best for now. The head waiter didn't know where the wine had come from. The bridegroom didn't know. But he attests to its superb quality. It's much better. This is the best wine he's probably ever tasted. I like one guy said, he said, the world always gives its best things first and saves its worst things for last. Sin draws you in by its instant gratification, but it hides the painful long-term consequences until later. Jesus' servants, on the other hand, may have to suffer hardship and trials in this life, but he saves the best for last. We're promised eternity with him with no sorrow or pain or death. Jesus functions differently than the world. But when Jesus turned this water into wine, it was both plentiful and superb. And again, these are messianic indicators. A boatload of wine... And it was the best wine that could be made. Amazing. 150 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine. The whole town's there. So Jesus made an abundance of wine. And it was the finest quality. Amazing. And again, what is Christ doing? How did the master of the feast respond? Well, we read that. But the purpose of this first sign was to manifest the glory of Christ and the expected response is to believe in Jesus. It was to manifest his glory in a very simple, low-key way. But the expected response is to believe in Jesus. These miracles authenticated the person of Christ and it revealed the spheres in which he exercised his authority. You know, throughout the Gospels, you see Christ exercising authority over nature, over demons, over sickness, over disease, over the physical, over the emotional, and even over death as he raises Lazarus from the grave. Whoops, I am missing some slides here. But it says here very clearly that the miracle revealed his glory. And then the second place is disciples put their faith in him. Now, this doesn't mean they put their faith in him for salvation. What this means is that this bolstered the faith they already had. It bolstered the faith they already had. But the sign demands that you answer two questions. 
Do you see the glory of Jesus Christ? And are you tasting his wine? Do you see his glory? You know, it's interesting. When you compare this to the Old Testament, Moses, when he was interacting with God, as God says, I talk to Moses face to face, Moses asked God, he says, will you show me your glory? And God says, well, I can only show you my back parts because no one can look at God and live, so to speak. So Moses was the mediator of the Old Covenant. He was not granted the privilege of seeing the glory of God and the Word made flesh and dwelling among us. But again, what does Jesus, what does John say? We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, in turning water to wine, Jesus manifested the glory of the only begotten of the Father. He created all things, John. If you turn over to John chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. What did this miracle just verify? That very reality right there. Jesus created wine out of nothing, basically, out of water. Amazing. And it was a symbol of the presence of the Messiah. Now, the disciples saw the, his glory in that sign. What about the servants, the ones that brought the wine? What about the other guests at the wedding? They enjoyed the miraculous new wine, but they failed to see Jesus' glory. See, this reaffirms another thing that John mentions in his prologue. If you look at chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own creation, and his own, that, that's his own people, did not receive him. Isn't that interesting? Now, what's the difference between the disciples and the rest of the people at the wedding? The disciples paid attention. The disciples had a heart condition that says, I believe this is Messiah. And when it comes to spiritual principles, the attitude of the heart is the most critical thing because believing is seeing. The skeptic says, if I don't see something, I'm not going to believe. Well, that just means you'll never see anything because the evidence is overwhelming, just like that slide I put up earlier. This in and of itself should humble you to the point where says, wow, who is the God that made this? And this is why every individual, regardless of their background, station in life or circumstances, is going to be held accountable for the light of creation. It's so overwhelming. God says every individual is without excuse. End of story. But when they had a soft heart, and they had a heart that wanted to see the Lord. Did the Lord faithfully show himself? And the answer was, yes, he did. And you know, as I think about application to believers, if you are paying attention to even the little things in life and the little ways God is working, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see him working, and you're going to give him glory. On the other hand, you could be no different than the servants and no different than the head waiter, no different than the bridegroom and everyone else that was there. And say, wow, this has got some good wine. Cool. Great. And not even realize God's in it. And I'm finding in the 30-some years that I have been saved that those who flourish spiritually are the ones that stop and take a look and in their heart they want to see the glory of God in their life. And God never fails them. And the ones who don't are the ones that shake their fist at God, the ones that say, how could you let this happen? The ones that are oblivious to his work in their life, and they take everything for granted. In fact, if everything isn't just the way I want it, why should I bother with God? And there's a spectrum there. And every one of us is on that spectrum somewhere. 
And the ones that have peace and joy and victory in life are the ones that are saying, wow, look at what my Savior is doing. He does all things well, superbly, abundantly. Even the little things, even through the pain and the difficulty, I recognize all things work together for good, and God's in this, and he is worthy of my glory. And the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's coming. Or you could be the other believer. Why can't I get some wine around here? You know, why do I got to drink this garbage? And they're unthankful. They don't realize how merciful God has been with them. Instead of thanking God for the abundant mercy he's shown in life, they're finding everything in the world to complain about and murmur is their middle name. Murmur, 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 murmur. You know, God's glory is often revealed in the little things, undertaking for you in ways that if you're not paying attention, you're not even going to see. And so you'll find the negative in everything. How many people at this wedding, again, there's a boatload of people here. The whole village is there. And they didn't see the hand of God or give God the glory. They didn't see the glory of God in anything. But the ones that did couldn't have been any more thrilled. Are you paying attention to what's going on and the little things in your life? Do you, do you take time and say, you know what, Lord, thank you. You know, we occasionally sing that song, Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. If you have purpose in your heart to be thankful, and you stop and think about all the things to be thankful for, you're not going to be complaining about anything. Because if you got what you deserved, you'd be in hell today. So this is a pretty good day, because guess what? You're not there. In fact, this is a great day to give God the glory, isn't it? And so the ones that are paying attention throughout the Gospel of John, how many people read the Gospel of John? doesn't make a dime's worth of difference. And God says, I have given this specific Gospel, so if you read this with a soft heart, you're going to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you're going to get life through his name. Isn't that amazing? That's how powerful this book is. That blows my brain. I just thought this is a very simple, low-key wedding, but it shows that Jesus Christ is the maker of all things, and this was designed to bring glory to him, and his disciples got it. Now, they got problems because they're going to miss all kinds of things down the road, just like we do. But boy, if you're paying attention, are you paying attention this morning? Are you paying attention to the little things that God is doing in your life so that you thank him? I tell you what, if you want a life of peace, of joy, and happiness, that's the ticket. If you want a, joyce of, a, loy, a life that's full of difficulty and internal turmoil and frustration, want everything on your terms and don't see the hand of God in it. The disciples benefited. We don't know if anyone else did. They wanted to see the glory of God and they saw it. And they believed in him all the more. Isn't that cool? What a great story. What a great lesson. Jesus does all things well. He gave abundantly. He made abundant wine. He made superb wine. And he does all things well. Let's pray. Father, we're just humbled as we consider our Savior. Consider the Gospel of John here, written so that we would see that you are the Christ, the Son of God. You're the life giver. You're the Savior of the world. You're the one who knows us intimately in ways that we can even ever know, and you care for us above measure. And you want us to appreciate you in the deeper things and the simple things and all things. And we know as we read the scriptures that our heart is the key to the whole thing. What do we want? What do we want to see from you? Do we want to see you glorified? I pray that would be our heart's desire this morning, that we'd be so grateful for what you went through on the cross of Calvary to give us a life we don't deserve, a life that will never end, and every spiritual blessing <clears throat> and heavenly places in Christ. I pray, Father, for those that are struggling this morning, that they would see who you are, and they would see that the chief end of man is to glorify you, and they'd pay attention to little things and the ways that you've blessed them, ways often we take for granted. So thank you for this passage. Thank you for 
including it in the scriptures. May we learn from this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.